Now let's look at a few useful Kubernetes commands. From an administrative standpoint, probably the most useful command is kubectl. If you pipe that to head, you can see some of the things it can do, like creating resources. It can also run th images. You can also do exec, like you would do with Docker, and many other things. First, though, you want to make sure that you have the path set correctly, so you can do a which kubectl to be sure that that is the case. And the default location is here, or certainly a common location, at least. You'll use that command so often, I like to create an alias. So something like this, where k equals kubectl, and now you can just type in k, and you'll get the same output. Now, notice that you can connect from your laptop into the Kubernetes cluster, and that might be running on Bluemix or some other provider, or possibly running privately. But notice that your PC may be running Windows, might be a Mac, and this cluster typically is going to be running Linux, but it doesn't matter because kubectl can be run from here outside the cluster, or you can run it, say, on the master, or you can run it somewhere else, say a machine somewhere else inside this cluster. It, this part doesn't matter. But what does matter is that your connection into the cluster must use a config file to do its work. And of course, uh, leave it to you to make sure that the network connection here is set up, but your cloud provider would give you instructions. Or if it's done privately, you'd get instructions from an administrator. Now, specifically, kubectl, when it is running on whichever machine it is running on, needs to find the configuration file in order to make this connection in. And you can do that either as an environment variable on your computer, or you can set it in a file. If you forget and don't provide the configuration file, you should expect to get an error message about a connection. And this is due to the configuration file not being actively available for kubectl. Let's start with the environment variable option. Here I am on Windows. If I do a set and do a find string, so it's like a grep in CMD, you can see that I have a configuration file which actually points to a YAML file. Now, if I open that YAML file, you can see the API version, the clusters, it'll give you the server that you're on, the certificate authority that's been set up, and so on and so forth, along with the provider. Now, these are typical details for these YAML files. It's also important to notice the kind, especially when you're looking at any YAML file, because it tells you what kind of file you are dealing with. Now, because it gets annoying to type that in every single time in your shell, you can make sure that that is set each time you log into your shell with bash underscore profile or profile. But the other way to do this is not set it in an environment variable and instead set that in a file. So to make that work, whichever profile you're logged into, make sure that you have a .cube directory and put the YAML file in a file called config. And every time you run kubectl, you won't need to have previously entered an environment command. Now, one of the most useful commands you can issue is kubectl get all, which will bring you a list back of all of the things running. And by things, I really mean resources. In this case, you'll see a PO that stands for pod and then a slash, and then the name of the pod that's currently running is busybox. Now, in a more active environment, you would see pods listed first, then followed by services, and then deployments which we haven't really covered, and replica sets, which we haven't covered much in detail either. But notice what you're getting, the cluster IP address. So these all start with 10. In this case, these are private IP addresses. Then you see the ports, but these ports are not being exposed outside the cluster. So these are just internal to the cluster. And you'll see the age, how long these have been up, up and running. And then notice the pod names at the top. You'll have the name of the pod, DB2, and then a unique identifier to indicate or identify a specific replica of this pod for these deployments and replica sets. Because we did cover slightly in an earlier video that a replica set contains multiple replicas. This tells you which replica is running on a given system. Now, the given system isn't actually here. So to find that, you need to run a slightly different command, which is O and then wide. Now, you might be wondering, where does the O come from? Remember, you can do a dash dash help. That will load a Go template, Go. that's Go language. And you can immediately see additional information. The dash O will give you an IP address, so you can see the pod's IP address. And you can also see the node on which that pod is currently running. You also get to see the image when it comes to a deployment reference. So these resources all have images. So these you can sort of consider these to be uh, 
the thing that is running. So that runs from a particular image. This is coming from a private registry. That's the port 5000 here from Docker. And you also get the image from the replica set on which the deploy uh, the deploy resource is based. You, you can also see the service cluster IP. We saw that before. We saw the ports and the only difference here is now you have a selector. The selector is a label that you apply, we'll go into this later, that you apply to your deployment or your deploy uh, resources that kind of attach themselves when you use the right ones to the service based on whatever selector. Is. So if you have an, uh, an analytics uh, label and the selectors analytics this will get attached into that service. Now notice too that a get all doesn't really bring back all where all means resources. What it really did under the hood was dash dash namespace equals default. Now how would you know that? Well open up your configuration file and take a look there is default defined it's called the namespace and that is defined in something called the context. A context lets you switch between clusters when you have multiple clusters. This particular cluster is called my cluster. So if you really want all, then you need to issue all namespaces. And you can find that if you weren't sure that it was there or that how you would even get it, you can do a grep for all in the help and see, sure enough, all namespaces. And by default, that is set to false. Its output looks like this. So this is interesting because now you're seeing the namespace listed in addition to the resources that are involved. And in case you were curious, yes, you can do an O wide with that, which will give you a listing something like this. You can also ask for just the nodes with a command like this, or you can ask for just pods with something like this, or if you notice it was abbreviated before as PO and you can do the same, you can also ask for cluster information, or you can ask for events, things that have happened on the system. You can also ask for just services. You can also create resources like pods, but you need to start from a YAML file. Here is a sample we'll be using. I'm just changing the name here from BusyBox to MyPod. And then without doing anything else, let's see where we're at right now. So this is before creating the pod. And then to create the pod, you'll issue the create command and give it the dash F for file argument. And then you give it the file that you want that has all the instructions and hit enter. And now if we do a get all, we'll see we have two separate pods. To delete a pod, you issue the delete command. And then you have to say what it is, which resource that it is you want to delete. And with this is a pod. And then you give it the name of the pod. And you'll say my pod. And that will delete it, which you can confirm with get all. And this is interesting because you can see the progress as this moves along. Now, if you want to see this because it may take time, you can do a watch. And this will show you over time how it progresses. Now, the command will fail like it did just a second ago, unless you give it the full name of the command. You can't use an alias here. And now you can see the progress with, by default, a refresh of two seconds. You can also run commands on these pods with an exec, just like Docker would do. And this is an interactive terminal. And then the shell, if you want the shell. And in the case of BusyBox, you now get DNS utilities, which we'll be looking at soon. But here's a spoiler. All of the pods can communicate through to each other via DNS internal to the cluster. And just like Docker, you're really not supposed to be opening up shells directly to these pods. Instead, you should be running commands like this, where you just give it the command at the end of the line. And that will give you the same result. But notice that you do not need the IT in these cases. You're not running it interactively, and there's no terminal required. So you really should run it like this. Now, with Docker's exec command, you need to be on that machine for the exec to actually work. Whereas with the Kubernetes exec command, you'll actually run it, say, from your laptop, but that will connect over to the cluster, as we've seen, locate the node, then find the pod, and execute the instructions on that pod. So that's very nice because it gives you a single point of administration for a vastly distributed system.